Praise God. Let's turn over to Mark chapter 11. How many of you, this will be your first service that you've made out of this set of meetings. Can I see your hand, please? Praise God. A lot of new people. We do have CDs and DVDs of the services. I uh, already made the two previous services that are complete. This one will be complete within five minutes of the end of this service, and you can get those out there. I encourage you to get it. I've basically been teaching on a subject that I call uh, You've Already Got It. I've got a tape set, a book out there, a study guide, and other things. But, you know, every time I teach things, things come out different, and this has been a little different. So it would be, be beneficial to you to get this teaching, even if you've heard some of this before. But what I've been talking about, I used Ephesians chapter 1 to show that Paul prayed that our eyes would be open to what we already have. We don't need God to do something new. We don't need to pray for God to send revival. You've got the supernatural raising from the dead power of God on the inside of you. And if we would start walking in what we have, you would have all of the revival you could handle. You go out and see people raised from the dead, and I guarantee you, you'll get people's attention. You can draw a crowd. You go out and start seeing miracles. We don't need to pray like God needs to do something. God has done it. We are the answer to the world's problems. We've got the power of God in us. We need to believe what we've already got. And I was trying to get this across that instead of always saying, God, you can do anything. You have done nothing, but you could do it. And pray and beg him to do it. Instead, we need to find out what he's already done and just walk in it. We've already got it. God has already put all of his power on the inside of us, and we don't need to learn how to beg better from God. We need somebody that'll believe what's already been done and stand up and take that authority. Then this morning, I was teaching from uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, that grace has already provided everything and faith is simply our response to what God has already done. That's a huge statement. Huge. I know it's easy to say, and some of you, this just goes right over your head, but that's huge. Most people are trying to do faith and believing that God will respond to it. We have statements like, faith moves God. It's untrue. Faith does not move God. God moves by grace. Faith simply appropriates what God has already provided by grace. And if God hasn't already provided it, you can't make God do anything with faith. God doesn't respond to your faith. Your faith is a response to God. Amen. Huge difference. If you didn't get that, you need to get the teaching from last night and this morning. Look here in Mark chapter 11, and I want to use these verses to illustrate what I was talking about. Jesus had turned the, he had cursed the fig tree. He didn't touch it. He just spoke to it. And the next day, his disciples saw it totally dead, dried up from the roots. And they were absolutely shocked with this. They couldn't believe that you could just talk to a tree and in 24 hours, it was totally dried up. And they said, Lord, the fig tree that you cursed is withered away. And the Lord said, have faith in God. You know, we don't have the benefit of hearing his intonation and the way he said that, but I don't believe he said, have faith in God. <laughs> I believe it was something like, have faith in God. What's wrong with you guys? Why don't you learn how to believe? Don't you understand the power of faith? And then he began to teach them how faith works. In verse 23, he says, For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Man, there's a lot in that. I've preached on that for days at a time. I'm going to skip that verse, and I want to focus your attention on verse 24. It says, Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. Man, that is a powerful verse. Whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, not when you see it, but when you pray, 
believe that you receive it, and then you shall, future tense, see it. You have to believe you see it before you see it in order to see it. You have to believe you receive when you pray. And this verse says, whatsoever things you desire. You know, there was actually a woman in Arlington, Texas, the town that I grew up in, and during the early days of the charismatic movement, she started a little Bible study and had turned it into a Bible college, had about 10 or 15 women that were a part of this Bible college. And she uh, taught on faith. And if you weren't here this morning, I tried to put all this in balance. I won't go back through it. But you can get out of balance with faith. If faith isn't in what God has already done by grace, it can become very legalistic. And people use faith like a pry bar on God to make God do something, to make God move. And this is what this woman in this Bible study uh, fell into. And they actually got to teaching that you could just claim anything based on Mark 11, 24. And this woman desired to have Kenneth Copeland as her husband. So she claimed Kenneth Copeland to be her husband. And it just so happened that Kenneth Copeland was married to Gloria Copeland. <laughs> And so the way that they dealt with that, she cursed Gloria Copeland and commanded her to die and get out of the way. And then she was going to marry Kenneth. And they went so far that she actually got a wedding dress and they had a ceremony where in the spirit, she married Kenneth Copeland. He wasn't there, but in the spirit, she married him. And they based it all on Mark 11. 24, whatsoever things you desire. Isn't wanting to marry a person a whatsoever? Why can't you just sit there and say, I claim this person and marry them in the spirit and base it on Mark 11, 24 and claim that you're going to marry them. And if, they've, if they're married to somebody, curse them, command them to die and get them out of the way so that you can marry. Why can't you do that? See, most people will sit there and say, well, I don't believe that's right. Just because you don't feel that it's right. Explain to me why it's not right. Didn't it say whatsoever? Why can't you do it? Here's the answer. Because God, by grace, did not provide for murder and adultery in his atonement. That's not a part of what Jesus bought. And so you can't, with your faith, make him move and confess with your mouth and believe in your heart and make something come to pass. See, if you understood this, it would really add a lot of, it would just explain things and help you to walk in the Christian life. You don't make God do anything. You don't make God heal you. You don't make God prosper you. You don't make God give you a car or give you a house. You don't make God do anything. Faith, God does not respond to your faith. God anticipated every need that we would ever have. And Jesus came to this earth and died not only for the forgiveness of our sins, but died for our financial prosperity, died for our healing, died for our emotional well-being, died for our relationships. He's already purchased these things. And by grace, he's done everything he's going to do. And he is now seated at the right hand to God the Father. God is not responding to you. But you, faith is your response to him. If you need a healing in your body, you don't need to go and beg him to heal you, but instead you ought to go back and read the word. By his stripes you were healed. By his stripes. That took place in Herod's judgment hall. He's not taking stripes in heaven. He's not being punished. He's not being whipped. That took place 2,000 years ago. You were healed 2,000 years ago, and he's now seated at the Father's right hand, and all you've got to do is respond to what he's done, and it becomes a reality. You put faith in his grace, and power is released. But if you are trying to make God do something with your faith, then in a sense, see, you are denying what Jesus has already done. You are trying to take his place. I could just make applications of this through every area of the Christian life. But you know, much of the body of Christ, the way they intercede, they are interceding the way an Old Testament saint did where they command God to repent. Moses said that. Exodus chapter 32, repent of this evil and turn. And the amazing thing is God repented. 
They told God to repent. They told God to come down. They begged and they pleaded with God in the Old Testament. And you know what? It was appropriate because the new covenant hadn't happened. The atonement hadn't been made. Jesus hadn't died for our sins. And there was wrath from God against people. And intercessors had to stand in between God and man and tell him to turn from his fierce wrath. And the sad thing is, in the New Testament, Christians are still doing the same thing. And Christians are saying, oh God, don't destroy America. Oh God, turn. And we're trying to get a million people together to pray to turn God from his wrath. What's wrong with that is that Jesus has already turned God from his wrath. Jesus is the intercessor to end all of that type of intercession. It says this over in 1 Timothy chapter 2, I believe it's verse 5, that there is one intercessor between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Moses was called an intercessor and it was appropriate for his day because Jesus hadn't come yet. He wasn't the intercessor. But now that Jesus has come, there's only one intercessor. And if you intercede the way Moses did or the way Abraham did, then you are anti-Christ. You are taking his position and you are trying to intercede and do what he's already done. I know most people are like, that's a terrible thing to say, but that's actually what's happening. People are acting as if Jesus hasn't already reconciled us to God, as if God is still mad and he's ready to destroy America if we don't turn. That's not true. God has placed all of his wrath against us upon Jesus, and God is not going to destroy America for our ungodliness. Does that mean that America's safe? No, because we're in the process of destroying ourselves. We are yielding to the devil big time and there are still consequences to sin. And if America doesn't change, America is headed in the wrong direction. We can't last very long the way that we're going. So am I saying that there's no consequences? No, we need to turn to the Lord, but I'm telling you, God's not going to judge us. We're in the process of destroying ourselves. Jonah chapter two, verse eight, Jonah said this after coming out of the belly of the well. He says, those that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Man, if you aren't seeking the Lord, you are the one that's stopping God. You tie God's hands. God is not going to intervene in your life without you welcoming him in. He doesn't force himself upon anybody. And if you don't seek the Lord, then you get destroyed, but it's not God that's destroying you. There's a difference between the way things were done in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. It's totally different. And so you can't just sit there and see with your faith, make God do something. God in the New Covenant has anticipated everything that will ever happen. There's never anything that's going to happen to you that the Lord didn't know it would happen. And he's already provided enough joy, enough peace, enough strength, enough anointing to deal with anything that is going to happen to you throughout your entire life. It's already dealt with and it's on the inside of you. It's not out there in heaven someplace that you've got to pray it down. The power of God is already on the inside of you. And this is kind of an oversimplification, but to a very large degree, it's as simple as just renewing your mind. You've already got everything in your spirit and as quickly as you can renew your mind and believe and think like God, then what you have in your spirit will come out into the physical realm and you'll walk in health and victory and power. This is the reason that Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You've already got everything in your spirit. Your spirit's perfect. Your heart's perfect. One third of you is as complete as it will ever get, but you've got to get your mind in agreement. You got three parts. And if you get, your spirit's always perfect. If you get your mind in agreement with your spirit, it's two against one and your body will just walk in health. It'll walk in peace. It'll walk in joy and power. As a man thinks in his heart, Proverbs 23, seven, that's the way that they are. Your life is going the way it's going because of the way you think. And if you are thinking that God can do something, but he has done nothing, and so you are asking and waiting on God, then you are going to live a life of defeat. 
And actually, you'll be more frustrated than the people that don't believe God can do all of these things because you'll believe he could do it and then you'll wonder why isn't he doing it? Truth is, he's already done it. He's already placed it on the inside of you. You have to stand up and you have to release it. You have to draw this power out. Let's turn over to Hebrews chapter four and tonight I'm gonna try and quickly do this. And I wanna give you one of the greatest pictures to illustrate what I'm trying to say. This is powerful. And I wanna say that in the King James right here, this is not, this is really wordy and it's hard to get reading it from the King James. But I don't have another translation with me and so I'm just gonna explain this to you quickly, all right? But uh, he's talking in Hebrews chapter four, in chapter three, he says, you need to beware. The children of Israel came out of the land of Egypt, but they never did enter into the promised land. That generation died without receiving what God had for them. It's not automatic. You have to believe in order to receive God's plans for you. God's plans were never for the Israelites to die in the wilderness. He wanted the in, them to enter into the promised land, but because of their unbelief, they didn't experience it. And he's saying that the same thing can happen to a New Testament believer, so he warns us. That's how he starts chapter four. He says, let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. In other words, the word has come to us the same as the word came to the children of Israel in the land of Egypt, but the word didn't profit them because they didn't operate in faith. They got in fear and they wanted to go back to Egypt. And so he says in verse three, for we which have believed do enter into rest as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest. That's a quotation from Psalms chapter 95, verse 11. And anyway, let me just go through and summarize some of this. But what he's saying, he says that he quotes this verse, Psalms 95, 11, and he says that let, uh, there is, remains a rest for the people of God. And then he makes this point that this is not talking about entering into the promised land and that rest because when David wrote this, it was over 480 years after the children of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt. So David couldn't have been talking about entering into the promised land. That's not the rest. There was another rest for the people of God. And he makes this point that there remains a rest therefore for the people of God. And he likens it to a Sabbath rest. He compares it to a Sabbath rest and he even quotes from Genesis chapter two, where after in Genesis chapter one, God had created the heavens and the earth. It says God rested on the seventh day. And he uses this as an illustration saying, there is a rest for us. It's available to all born again people, but it's not automatic. You have to believe to enter into this rest. And he goes on and says a lot of things about it. And he even says this in verse nine, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. And um, in verse 11, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest. You know, these words, most people get confused and they think, wait a minute, I thought he was talking about resting in the Lord. And now he's talking about laboring to enter into this rest. The reason that a lot of people don't connect with this is because when we think of rest, you think of being tired and laying down and just doing nothing. You know, the Bible says that God rested on the seventh day. That wasn't because he was tired. Isaiah chapter 40 says, I don't get tired. I don't sleep. There is no limit to his strength. The Lord didn't rest on the seventh day because he was pooped. If he had created one more star, he just didn't have it in him. He was worn out and he had to rest from creation. That's not what it's talking about. The reason he rested is like when a lawyer you know, presents his case. And then he says the defense rest or the prosecution rest because you've said everything there is to say. You're through, it's complete. It's like when a painter paints a picture and you look at it and if you put one more brush stroke to it, you're gonna ruin the whole thing. And so the, 
the artist rests, not because that paintbrush is so heavy he had to put it down. It's because he's through, it's complete, everything's done. Now this is really significant. The Lord rested after six days of creation, not because he was tired, but because everything was complete and, and it was right at the end of that sixth day when he created man and man entered into this Sabbath, into this place where everything that he could ever need was anticipated and created in advance of God creating him. Did you know that the Bible clearly teaches that mankind is the focus of creation? We're losing this perspective because we're becoming increasingly humanistic. The world is more dominant than the church and they put importance on snail darters above people and spotted owls and all of this kind of stuff. And, and you know, they will sit there and murder 53 million unborn children, but they will just get upset over you killing a dog. And they'll have these commercials on where these dogs have these pitiful looks and don't want you please help this dog. And I always want to yell out, those of you that put this ad on, how many kids have you aborted? And yet they're going to sit there and protect the sperm whale and all of this kind of stuff. It's just totally mis... I'm not saying that we ought to be mean to animals or anything, but I'm telling you, mankind was the crowning jewel of God's creation. We are the focus of God's creation. One person is worth more than all the animals on the entire planet. I know a lot of people won't like that, and you're entitled to your opinion, but I'm not going to agree with you or we'd both be wrong. Amen. Amen. So we are the focus of God's creation. God so loved mankind that he died for our sins. He didn't die for the dogs and the whales. He died for people. We are the focus of God's creation. Well, then why didn't he create us first? You know why? Because it wasn't ready for us. If he would have created man on the first day, there wasn't light yet. We'd have frozen to death. If he'd have created us on the first day, did you know it was the, uh, the third or the fourth day before he created ground? We would have had the dog paddle for two days. <laughs> and then as God had all of these continents come up, can you imagine the tidal waves and everything else you'd have been overwhelmed with? If he'd have created us first and if we'd have found land then when he said, let there be trees, let there be grass, all of these trees would have been popping up and everything and you'd have been dodging it. You wouldn't have had any food to eat. Did you know food wasn't created until the fourth and the fifth day and you would have gone hungry for two or three days. The reason God created us at the very end is because he anticipated every need that mankind will ever have. Did you know that right now we have 7 billion people on this planet and God has never created any new oxygen? He created enough oxygen for 7 billion people 6,000 years ago. He created everything. And I don't care if it gets to where there's 14 billion people. There's enough oxygen. God's anticipated everything that we'll ever need. Here's a little aside, but this is why I am not a tree hugger and why I'm not an environmentalist and I'm not worried about the fragile earth. That stuff's a crock. God has envisioned anything that mankind could ever do to this earth and this earth can take it. Now that is not to say that you go out and pollute things. I don't do that. I'm not into doing damage to stuff, but you know, I just saw a special on, uh, I think it was Wednesday night here in Phoenix and they were talking about uh, Iceland and the volcanoes there. And they talked about in 18, I think it was 59 or something like that, 1859, they had an eruption go off that literally caused the coldest summer that on history. France had snow in June. It was the coldest summer because all of this stuff went up into the atmosphere. Entire species of animals died off 
It affected the entire world. And yet in two or three years, the world accommodated it and responded to it and it overcame it. And they made the comparison that it was like spewing enough carbon dioxide and stuff into the atmosphere. It was like one million times more than all of the human race puts that forth right now. And it was done through one volcano and it took a couple of years and the earth adjusted and overcame it. This whole thing that it's so fragile and man is going to destroy the earth. That comes from people who don't understand that God is almighty. He anticipated anything that the human race could ever do. And this earth is well able to accommodate and rebound. No one person or all of us put together can overcome God's creation. He created enough oxygen for all of the people that will ever live. When there was only two people on this earth, there was enough oxygen here to sustain seven billion people. He created enough food right now, seven billion people. All of the food that the world needs was here when God created it. Man didn't have to go plant a tree. People say, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, the chicken, of course. God created the animals and then told them to be fruitful and multiply. He created the grass and he says, you've got seed in yourself. If you'd read the Bible, you wouldn't have these stupid questions like that. <laughs> God created trees full grown. They already had fruit on them. And man, when they were created, were able to just reach out and partake of the fruit. They didn't have to go plant it and wait seven years for it to grow or they would have died. God created everything. Everything was perfect. The climate was perfect. The food was perfect. The oxygen was perfect. Everything was absolutely perfect. He created all of the animals. And then the last thing that he created was man. You know why? Because all of this was created for us. And he created a perfect world for us. And then as soon as we were created, God rested and man entered into his rest where he didn't have to say, oh God, give me oxygen to breathe. God had already anticipated that and had all of the oxygen they need. God, give me something to eat. There was already so much fruit. There was fruit just falling to the ground by the millions. There was more food than he could ever eat. He didn't have to go ask God to supply him with anything. Everything was already created. And so man, when he was created, immediately entered into the rest, into the Sabbath, where God had anticipated every need he would ever have, and it was done. Did you know all of the cars that we make today, did you know nobody has had to create a car? All of the materials involved in a car, they were already here. God anticipated whatever mankind would ever invent and come up with, and there were already materials in the ground. There were already minerals. There were already rocks. He's given us wisdom to turn them into steel and into aluminum and into, you know, computer parts and anything, anything that the world ever needs, God has already anticipated. There is nothing that we can ever need that we will run out of. Now, we may run out of fossil fuel someday, but if we do, there's some other way. God's already created. He's anticipated everything that we'll ever need, and it was done. And when man came along, all he had to do was reach out and take it and say thank you. God had already provided it, and they entered into his rest. And did you know that this is what the Sabbath is all about? Boy, the Jehovah, I mean, the uh, who is it? Seventh-day Adventists aren't going to like this, but let me show you something over here in Colossians chapter 2. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. Boy, I wish I had time to put this in its context. This is powerful about being liberated from the Old Testament law and thinking that you've got to do things to appease God. You're already free, and the handwriting of ordinances was taken out of the way and nailed to the cross and we now have a triumphant procession where Satan has been destroyed. It's awesome, the things that are said right here. And then he says in verse 16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of a holiday, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. There's five things listed here. Five things. Don't let anybody judge you or condemn you over meat. And this was talking about that, you know, in the Old Testament law, there were certain dietary laws about things that you could eat and couldn't eat. 
the ones that are most familiar to people today is that uh, Jews couldn't eat pork. That was an unclean animal. But did you know they also couldn't eat shrimp? You couldn't eat shellfish, uh, lobster, crab, anything like that was forbidden. There was a lot of things that were forbidden. And if you are going to sit there and say that you've got to still observe these laws, then you couldn't eat any of these shellfish. You couldn't eat a lot of different things. Did you know most Christians today understand that this, was, this isn't for us? Matter of fact, it says in 1 uh, Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 3 there, it says, don't let any man tell you that you can't eat meat. It's a doctrine of devils. Let me just turn over and read this. Some of you think I'm making this up. 1 Timothy chapter 4, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter's times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and to doctrines of devils. Guess what? We're in the latter times. This is talking about our day, and it says that they will give heed to the doctrines of devil. And now it lists what they are. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Forbidding to marry. Did you know forbidding to marry is a doctrine of the devil? If you say that to be a real representative of the Lord, you've got to be celibate, it's a doctrine of the devil. And brothers and sisters, I'm not against anybody, I'm not mad at anybody, but this is why the Catholic Church and stuff has had so much sodomy, homosexuality, because that is a doctrine of the devil. God did not create people to live without that relationship and to put people in this position and command them that you can't be married is a doctrine of the devil and you can see the effect of it in the Catholic Church today and how they've sodomized little children. It's wrong. It's a doctrine of the devil. That doesn't mean that the people are of the devil, but that doctrine is of the devil. Amen. I didn't write this. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. So a doctrine of the devil is to forbid to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. So anybody who tells you that you can't eat pork, that you can't eat shellfish, that you can't do this, that you've got to be a vegetarian, that you've got to quit eating processed food, that you've got to do this and this and this, it's a doctrine of the devil. Was that too uh, subtle? Anybody miss that? It's a doctrine of the devil. And people say, but God gave these laws in the Old Testament because these things are bad for you. Look at this again. Go over to Colossians chapter 2. I read this. Don't let any man judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of holidays or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. And verse 17 says, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. The Old Testament dietary laws were a shadow of a New Testament reality. It, had, it served a purpose in the Old Testament, but now that the shadow is past and we have the reality in Jesus, you don't observe the shadow. This is what the Bible says. There is not a single place in the Bible that says that the dietary laws were given for health benefits. The only place it says right here, it was given as a shadow of something that is now a reality. You know, if you could imagine that this pulpit is like a corner of a building and it goes up real high. And if you were standing over there and if I was standing here and if there was a light behind me and if you couldn't see me but you could see my shadow, that shadow would be really important. It could tell you whether I'm standing still, whether I'm walking towards you, whether I'm walking away from you. It could tell you if I'm carrying a gun or a club it could you know the shadow could give a lot of information to you if you can't see the person but if i walk around the corner and if i'm in full view and if you ran up and fell down and hugged my shadow and says oh it's so good to finally have you here we'd think something's wrong with you the shadow is only of use if you can't see the person before Jesus came, he gave all kinds of things in types and shadows, but they were all shadows and pictures of Jesus and what our relationship with him was about. 
In the New Testament, the counterpart to the dietary laws, it says whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do it all to the glory of God. Whether you eat or drink, do it to the glory of God. The Old Testament shadows were that you were supposed to be separated unto God, not just indulge yourself and eat anything. And he said, don't eat this just to discipline you so that you could recognize that you're supposed to glorify God even in what you eat. Now that we have the New Testament reality, it's not about these things. Man, I love bacon. That's my favorite food. <laughs> There's not a thing wrong with bacon. And some of you are saying, well, yeah, you can eat it and you'll still go to heaven, but you'll get there quicker. <laughs> it's not true. It's sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So the dietary laws were types and shadows. Most people in here, most Christians have accepted this. Most of you will eat bacon. Most of you will eat shrimp, lobster. So most of you say, well, that was Old Testament law. We're free from that. I agree. And then the next thing, it says, don't let anybody judge you in respect of drink. Did you know that there were restrictions on what you could drink? Do you know what the dietary laws concerning drink were? Most people don't. So apparently you must not feel like you're obligated to that. <laughs> so we look at that. Oh, that was just a picture and a shadow of something to come. The next thing it says, don't let anybody judge you in respect of a new moon. You know what that's talking about? Every time there was a new moon, you had to offer a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice to the Lord. How many of you offered a blood sacrifice last new moon? How many of you even know when the last new moon was? <laughs> well, apparently you must not be under that one because it, you don't have any conviction about it. And then the next thing it says, or of the Sabbath days. Now there's five things listed here and did you know what? Four of them, the body of Christ doesn't observe today and feels no conviction about it because that was Old Testament and we now live in the New Testament. We aren't under the types and shadows. But when it comes to the Sabbath, you've got entire denominations, the Seventh-day Adventist and other people that you've got to observe the Sabbath. And even some uh, people that are in the mainline denominations or spirit filled group will still sit there and say, you've still got to honor the Sabbath. You know, when I was a kid, we wouldn't mow our grass on Sunday. You didn't wash your dishes on Sunday. You waited until Monday to do it. I wouldn't go into a store and buy something on Sunday uh, if it was, I mean, I wouldn't go in on Friday and buy something if it was opened on Sunday. I only went to places that that closed on Sunday and we kept the Sabbath. But you know what's wrong with that? The Sabbath isn't Sunday. <laughs> the Sabbath is sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. That's the Sabbath. If you think that you gotta keep the Sabbath, then you gotta be a Seventh-day Adventist. Sunday is not the Sabbath and it's just, I've never read this anywhere, but it makes sense to me that the the reason the church observes the first day of the week is because that's the day that Jesus rose from the dead. They realized they were delivered from the Old Testament law and their day that they called the Lord's day was Sunday to be a specific break from the Old Testament Sabbath. They did not observe the Old Testament Sabbath. But the modern day church still observes the Sabbath to some degree. They think it's a day to watch football or do something else. <laughs> but you know what? The Sabbath, the Sabbath was a picture. What was the Sabbath a picture of? It was a picture of this relationship where you trust God. He's already provided everything and you are resting in him. That's what the Sabbath was meant to picture. You know, we were raised where there was a Sabbath and people took off, you know, they didn't work seven days a week. But you know, this is relatively new. It's only been in the last generation that people quit working seven days a week. And especially back in Bible days, these people were working seven days a week. They were working 15, 16 hour days, seven days a week. And here come the Jews and God tells them, take one day out of seven off. And did you know that this was totally different? They weren't raised under this mentality. It was crazy. 
They were barely getting by as it was, working every single waking hour that they could. And here they were supposed to take one out of seven days off. How would they ever prosper? And the Lord promised them, if you will do this, and trust me, it's, it's a way of showing you that even though you till the ground and you plant a seed, it is not your work that's making it come. It's the blessing of God. I'll bless you more in six days than the people who work seven days. And so they took one out of seven days off. And you know what? The Jews prospered and their crops brought forth better than anybody else's because their trust was in God. It was a way of making them trust in the Lord. And in case anybody missed that, which it should have been obvious, then in Leviticus chapter 25, the whole chapter is devoted to taking one year out of every seven years off. And they couldn't plant their crops and they couldn't harvest anything that grew out of the ground naturally. The seventh year, they had to take the entire year off and not work their fields. And it says in Levit Leviticus 25, somewhere around verse 12 or something like that. And it says, if you shall, if the people ask and say, how should we eat in the seventh year? He says, then I'll bless you on the sixth year and I'll give you three times a normal increase. Enough to carry you through the sixth year, through the seventh year, and through the eighth year while you start sowing your crops and waiting on the harvest to come in. And just like clockwork, any time that the Jews did this, God would bless them with three times a normal harvest in the sixth year to carry them through the eighth year. That's what the Sabbath was. The Sabbath was a way of saying that even though I'm working it's not my work that's making me prosperous. It's my covenant with God. It's my Father who is my source. And I'm not just going to say it. I'm going to prove it. I'm going to take one day out of seven off and trust God. And I'll prosper more than the people that work seven out of seven days. I'm going to take one year out of seven off and honor God. And I'll prosper more than the people that work seven years out of seven years. That's what the Sabbath was about. And that's the reason in Hebrews chapter 4, he calls this a Sabbath rest. Because this is a picture of the New Testament reality. You know, when God created all of these things in the beginning, it says he rested. And I could go into more detail on this. But God has never created another elephant. He's never created another bug, another mosquito. He's never created another tree. When God created everything, if you go back to Genesis chapter 1, it's very specific how he said it. He didn't just say, let there be trees, let there be grass. He said, let there be trees whose seed is in itself. Let there be grass whose seed is in itself that can reproduce. Let there be animals whose seed is in itself that will bring forth after their kind. For anybody who believes scripture, this kills evolution. God said everything reproduces after its kind. From the very beginning, there is no such thing as one kind becoming a different kind. Also, it makes it very clear that death entered the earth through Adam. For evolution to exist, there would have had to have been death for millions and millions and millions of years as one of these animals died and became another kind and they all mutated into something else. But the Bible says that death entered the earth through Adam in Romans chapter 5. That kills any theory of evolution. Amen. Death didn't exist before Adam. And so God created all of these things and he created them in such a way that when he rested... He has never created another tree. He's never created another person. He's never created another animal. He gave the creation the ability to procreate. He does not sit there and, you know, wake up and say, well, let there be a million new cows to replace all of the ones that were eaten. He created the original ones and gave them the ability to reproduce. And his creation, he doesn't do anything to make creation work. He created it and it's still functioning and it's going to function. We aren't going to sidetrack God's creation. It was perfect. And he has rested ever since then. He has not been creating anything. He's ended creation. And this is a perfect picture of salvation. 
that when Jesus came and brought our salvation, he anticipated every person who would ever breathe on the planet, every sin that would ever be committed, and he dealt with all sin, past, present, and even future. If the Lord tarried another thousand years, every atrocity that will ever be done, every person that will ever live, every sin that they will ever commit, he knew it and he died for it 2,000 years ago. It's already forgiven before the person was ever born and ever committed it. Every sickness that will ever hit any person from a cold to cancer to the next virus to the superbug, anything. He's anticipated every problem. Jesus died and paid for it 2,000 years ago and he hasn't done anything about healing since. He already healed all of our sicknesses and all of our diseases and he put this raising from the dead healing power on the inside of us and he does not have to do something to heal you. He's already healed you. That power is in you and all you got to do is stir it up by faith and release this supernatural power and it'll heal anything. It will solve any problem. There is no financial crisis. There's no recession that's ever going to happen. If the United States economy tanks, God is going to supply our need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. He's aware of every financial problem. And if you have a financial problem, God is already aware of it. He's already made a way to escape. And all you got to do is rest in him. And instead of saying, oh God, the American economy is in the tank. Oh God, please do something. Oh God, please supply me with something. See, you're already in unbelief. You're thinking something brand new has come up. If you would just rest in the Lord and say, God, you knew this was coming. You knew I was going to be laid off. You knew this would happen. So there's a way around this. You've already seen it. And you just rest in the Lord. Pray in tongues and say, give me wisdom. Show me what to do. And God will show you. Did you know that there's, they're calling it the Great Recession? It's supposed to be the biggest recession since the Depression happened in 2008. And did you know that most ministries, I'm aware of a lot of ministries, most ministries have decreased. They went, many of them nearly went belly up. It's been a tough time. That's when the Lord spoke to me about starting this expansion and accommodating all of these students and starting a $53 million building program to build a first class Bible campus and accommodate things. I started it in the midst of a recession. While everybody else is cutting back, I started expanding. And we've expanded our ministry so that it takes about $2 million a month just to pay our bills. And on top of that, I need another 53 million on top of the 2 million a month. And you know what? During the recession, we've doubled in our income. We've increased. God has blessed us. And somebody says, you can't do that. Well, don't wake me up because we've done it. It's working. And you know, one of the reasons is because I didn't look and at the situation and think that this caught God by surprise. God told me to do what I'm doing. I know that he's told me to do it. And if he told me to do it, well, then there's a way to do it. And I just have followed him. And you know what? God will make you look good. God will make you look smart if you just follow him. <laughs> but see, there's a lot of you. When things got bad, you immediately went to anticipating the worst and stuff because you weren't resting in him. You hadn't entered into this rest. You feel that every time the doctor gives you a diagnosis of something like this is the first time God's ever heard about it. And you go to him and you spend 30 minutes in prayer telling him what the doctor said. It's like God's got this huge desk in heaven and he's bound to have a million requests on his desk. And if you'll get lost in the inbox, if you don't convince him that this is urgent, you need to give attention to this. And so you spend 30 minutes telling God how bad it is and recounting all of the negative things that are said, hoping that you can impress God that this needs immediate attention. God knew your problems before you knew it, before the doctor told you this, before the banker told you this, before your husband or wife told you that they were leaving. God knew all about it. God's anticipated everything. He's already put on the inside of you everything it takes to be an overcomer in any situation. Amen. There is nothing without that even compares with the power that's on the inside. 
But that's only if you believe it and only if you rest in him and trust him. And the sad fact is most people, when something happens, they think it's brand new. They have to go to God, convince God to please do something. You get out of faith and into fear and then start trying to work your way back to faith. It's just much easier to just dwell in the rest. I'm telling you that there is a rest. Just like Adam and Eve didn't have to pray for air, didn't have to pray for food, didn't have to pray for the climate, didn't have to pray for anything. God had anticipated every need and all they did was just enter in and enjoy the abundance that God had provided. Likewise, as believers, God has already provided everything you will ever need. There isn't an emotion. There isn't a physical need. There's no financial need. There's nothing that could ever come your way that God hasn't anticipated and he's put the power on the inside of you to deal with it. And you just have to believe it and rest. And when something happens, you just go to the Lord. Father, thank you that this didn't take you by surprise. You've already made a way to escape. What is it? And this is when I pray in tongues. And I just say, Father, you know, the Bible says when you pray in tongues, it's your spirit that prays. But your understanding is unfruitful. And the verse in front of it says, pray that your understanding that you will be able to understand. So when I pray in tongues, I know that my spirit is praying. The part of me that has the mind of Christ, it knows all things. First, uh, uh, first John chapter 2, verse 20, I have an unction from the Holy One and I know all things. That's not true in my little brain up here, but it's true in my spirit. I have the mind of Christ. I know everything. So when I come up against something, I just start praying in tongues and say, Father, I want to interpret. Tell me what is, what's going on. In my spirit, I've got the answer already. I just need to get it out into my brain. You know, the building we're in right now, some of you might remember this, but in, two, let's see, it's 2002, the Lord told me I was limiting him by my small thinking. And we moved from a 14,000 square foot building into a 110,000 square foot building. The 14,000 foot building was paid for. There were no payments. Our utilities on this new building, they were projecting them to be 16,000 a month. I don't think it's ever turned out to be that much, but maybe what, 8,000? Huh? Eight to $10,000 a month just for utilities on the building. Man, back when I was in that 14,000 square foot building, I couldn't imagine paying $10,000 a month for utilities. It was just huge. It was huge to move from 14,000 to 110,000. Plus, we had to come up with $3.2 million to renovate the place. And we had just added the largest expanse to our television ministry that we'd ever had, $600,000 a month in just television time. And then by the time you give out free tapes and pay the people, they answer the phones and do everything, that's another 600. So we had to increase over a million dollars a month. And at that time when the Lord told me I was thinking too small and I needed to get a bigger place. And so we moved in and you know what? God supernaturally came through. But I, I was trying to get a loan to, to build out this building, $3.2 million. And for nine months, the banker told me, he says, next week, you'll have your money. You'll have your construction loan. Nine months, he told me, next week, next week, next week. And finally, after nine months, we met with him and he says, it's been so long, we need to get a new appraisal and let's just start the whole process over. And man, our Bible college was just maxed out. We had to put porta potties outside in the winter for the guys to use. And the women used the indoor toilets and we were cramped and, and I just couldn't go another nine months. We needed a miracle right then. And when they told us nine months, I just told him, I said, let me go home and pray about this. And I applied exactly what I'm talking about. I said, God, this is not taking you by surprise. I said, you've led me to do this. You gave us a supernatural deal on this. You've supplied all of the money. I know that you're in this. Why aren't things working? And I just said, I need your wisdom. Show me what to do. And instead of panicking and getting in unbelief and asking God, oh God, please give me money. God had led me to do this. And so the money was there somewhere. I just needed to figure out where it was and how to receive it. 
And so you know what I did? I went walking on this trail that I built and I started praying in tongues. And I said, Father, I'm going to pray in tongues because when I pray in tongues, it's my spirit that prays. It's the mind of Christ. And you told me I could pray and interpret. And I said, I need an interpretation. Tell me what I need to do. And within 10 minutes, God spoke to me and reminded me of a prophecy from two years before and said, you aren't going to need a, a loan to get this building done. And I had forgotten it. And he reminded me of this prophecy. He says, you don't need a loan because you've got a bank that's going to pay for the whole thing. Your partners are the bank. Amen. And I had just, I don't know, I just forgot it. I don't have an excuse. I just forgot it. And I'd been trying for nine months to get this loan. And the Lord spoke to me that your partners are your bank. And basically, he told me, you're going to do it debt free. $3.2 million. At that time, at the rate we had been saving money, I sat down and figured out it would have taken me over a hundred years to come up with $3.2 million at the rate we had been saving it. But I felt like that was what God spoke to me. I prayed in tongues. That was the interpretation. He reminded me of this. And so I spent about a week praying about it to make sure because it was a big deal. If I was missing God, it would have killed our ministry. Because if I say I'm going to build something debt-free, I'll, I'll do it debt-free. And if it meant destroying the ministry, I'm not going to change. If I commit to doing something, I'm going to do what I committed to doing. So for me to make this commitment that I wasn't going to take out a loan and that I was going to trust God, it either had to be God or it was going to destroy our ministry. And so I prayed about it. I told David, I said, if they come back and approve me tomorrow for the loan, I'm not going to take it out. I said, God told me that my partners are going to supply it and I'm going to do this debt free. And you know what? The next day, one of the places that we've been trying to get money from came through and says, you don't need 3.2. We're going to loan you $4 million. And I said, you're too late. I said, I've already got it. And I turned them down. And did you know in 14 months, God brought in that $3.2 million and we paid for that renovation in 14 months on top of all of the other expansion. And you know how all that happened? By just resting in the Lord and saying, God, this didn't take you by surprise. There's an answer. What is it? What do you want me to do? And I just prayed in tongues and asked God for an interpretation to show me what to do. I've done this hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. When you run into relational problems, God knew that these things are going to happen. He knew that people were going to come against you. There's an answer to it. Just rest in the Lord. See, all of this is involved in these scriptures in Hebrews chapter 4. There remains a rest for the people of God. And very few Christians are resting in the Lord, confident that God has anticipated everything that you will ever need. There's never anything that will happen to you that God hasn't already supplied the need before you had the need. If you have a financial need, God knew it was coming and he's already made a way for you to prosper. You don't have to worry about it. It's already done. If you have a physical need, it's already done. If you have an emotional need, God's already given you love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. It's already in there. All you got to do is draw it out. Man, I have people come to me all the time that are stressed out. I had a couple of people come and talk about all of the stress that they're under. And I asked them, have you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And they said, oh yeah. And I, I wasn't as blunt with them, but I basically, you know, told them, well, then I don't feel very much pity for you. If you've got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which it says is the rest wherewith you cause the weary to rest. And this is how you comfort people. And if you've got it, and if you aren't using it, well, then it's your fault. And yet there are many of you that have the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you get into trouble and you sit there and you will go to anybody else and ask them for their help. You'll turn to the world, you'll worry, you'll fret, you'll get stressed out when the whole time all you have to do is just start praying in tongues. It's just like, man, turning, flipping a switch and just peace starts flowing supernaturally. <laughs> and we just don't use it. You don't rest in the Lord. And notice it said down there, and I think verse 11, Hebrews 4, 11, you have to labor to enter into this rest. 
That sounds like a contradiction. If I'm going to rest, you don't labor to rest. You just lay down and rest. But when you're talking about staying in the Lord, staying in a place of peace and not letting fear grip you, not letting worry grip you and things like this, I guarantee you it takes labor to rest like that. You have to put yourself into the Word of God. If you're just plugged into this world, I guarantee you it will stress you out. This world is headed to hell in a hurry. It's getting ungodly. America was founded as a Christian nation, but it is not functioning as a Christian nation right now. It is operating super ungodly. It is doing things that are super ungodly. And I guarantee you, if all you're doing is looking in the natural realm, there will be worry and care. It takes effort to keep from being discouraged. It takes effort to keep your attention focused on the Lord and say, Father, I know that you knew everything that's going to happen and that you know what? You've got a way for me to survive and prosper and thrive. It takes effort to do that. You have to labor to rest in the Lord. It's not normal. It's normal to be stressed out, to worry, to operate in fear. It's not normal to have peace in your heart. But you can do it because Jesus has already anticipated. And according to our days, so shall our strength be, is what the scripture says. I don't care how bad things get. God will supply us. Did you know they, uh, Paul lived in a system that was much worse than our system? The guy that ruled his nation thought he was God and people worshipped him as God. I'm not sure that's not the same deal, but... <laughs> Anyway, it was more overt, it was more obvious in his day. And you know what? Paul still prospered. Slavery was the rule of the day. There was terrible things being done. It was ungodly. And yet Paul prospered and saw nations turn to the Lord. I don't care what happens in America. I'm going to prosper. I'll prosper. And if I get thrown in jail for preaching the gospel, I'll see a revival in jail. Amen. I'm going to prosper. I'm resting in the Lord. Paul survived in an ungodly situation that was worse than ours. I can survive in this one. There's nothing that's going to happen that's going to change anything between me and God. And I just rest in that. And I tell you, I know a lot of people think that I don't have problems, but I could have lots of problems. If I let things, if I took it personally and if I took care about it, I have things happen to me. I had, uh, I think it was Van and Regina talking to me and what I said yesterday or, or sometime about uh, being just stressed out three nights in one week without sleep and stuff. They were shocked that I had things like that happen. I'm shocked that people think I don't have problems. Just because I don't talk about them and because I don't embrace them, I have a lot of things happen. Not just things that happen to me, but people that I know and people that I love and pray for, staff, things that happen to them. I could be as stressed. I could have more problems in here than anybody I think in here. And yet I just choose to rest in the Lord and focus on what God has done. You can do this. There is a rest for you. And I'm telling you, it comes when you start recognizing that Jesus has already done it all. He's seated at the Father's right hand. It's already supplied and it's available to you. All you got to do is reach out and take it and say thank you. Instead of begging Him to do something, just say thank you and take what He has already provided. It's a much better way to live. You've already got it. So quit trying to get it. Just rest in it. Man, if you could understand what I've talked about tonight, this could change your life. It could totally, and it would just, it'd change everything. You know, prayer. I actually came out with a new series on prayer, A Better Way to Pray, because I taught so much on this right here. And one of the biggest comments, people would come up and say, so how do you pray? Why do you pray if you don't have to beg God for stuff? What's the point of prayer? So I had to come teach on prayer because most prayer is all about begging God. If you were to take away the time that you spend repenting and telling God how sorry you are and the time that you spend asking God for something, if you were to remove those two things from your prayer life, many of you wouldn't have anything left. 
And yet Adam and Eve prayed with God when there was no sin and there was nothing to ask for. And yet they prayed and fellowshiped with God every single day in the cool of the evening. 